Hi, I'm going to put you, um, how are you today? It's so good to put a face to a name. <laughs> Hi, I'm good. Actually, I'm really good. Same, same. It's nice to see you. Thank you for, thanks for giving me the chance to be involved. No, we're so, so excited to have you. And what I'm going to do is kind of uh, readmit you again after um, we do the intro. And... Okay. Um, then we can get started. Is that does that sound like a plan? That sounds perfect. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I know. I'm so bad at this. I'm just learning how to use it. I'm not very. I'm not very good with Zoom at all. So I'm glad I managed to actually get on with audio and video. <laughs>
Welcome um, to Chella Law's very first Immigration Stars and Strifes. Um, we've been doing a number of webinars, but this particular one we wanted to do to showcase the exceptional work of immigrants who are doing extraordinary initiatives in the United States, advancing American interests in all fields. And primarily that's so we can not only highlight the great work that they're doing, but you know, also kind of change the anti-immigrant sentiment that we've been hearing for some time now. And uh, recently, you know, through the COVID pandemic and especially the economic downturn, that seems to be, that voice seems to be even getting louder. Uh, recently, you had uh, a bunch of senators, four of them, including uh, Senator Cruz and Grassley, sent a letter to the president to expand his proclamation, uh, even greater to ban all types of immigration into the US. And citing that the downturn in the economy was the reason, but you know that's a that's a a fallacy uh, because it's not a zero sum game. Unemployment of one person doesn't mean that uh, they can fill a job um, that someone else is doing because the skill set might not be the same. Let's say I was out of a job and the hospital needed, you know, more doctors. Could I fill that need? I don't have the education, I don't have the experience and background, and it can't be readily taught so that I could advance very quickly. And that's pretty much how it is. And speaking of doctors, um, a vast majority of uh, our healthcare workers are either immigrants or from an immigrant background. And very recently, you know, as we're all worried about the continued impact of COVID, two of the companies that may be coming up with a vaccine, some kind of the front runners, um, both have immigrant, either a founder or quote co-founder. So aren't we glad they immigrated here where they're able to work directly with the FDA and Dr. Fauci and his team to quickly turn around this vaccine? So that's why we thought this discussion was really important because if you wanna change the narrative, you have to be part of the discussion. And that means not only uh, talking to those people who agree with your views, but making sure you include talking to everyone, even those people who are totally against um, what your beliefs are and having that discussion with civility and respect. And so we welcome all types of viewpoints here as long as they are uh, given with civility and respect. And with that, let's talk about uh, our guest today, Liz Tyson. Really excited uh, that she's on our show. This morning I was listening to how um, this self-secluding could lead to a surge in problems within mental illness. And then, you know, everyone's excited about Tiger King and the whole idea that we, as we're isolating because of the pandemic, are enjoying watching um, big cats taken out of their natural habitat and held captive was a bit strange. Um, so we can hear what effects that has, we know what it has on humans, but what that effect that has on animals. So Liz is internationally renowned as a animal captivity activist. Um, She's testified before the Scottish Parliament and was able to um, effectuate change in terms of legislation. Her PhD thesis, uh, which her PhD, she was one of the first to create a PhD in animal law. And um, her thesis was read by the UK Parliament. And in 2019, they changed um, they're, you know, they banned all wild animals in traveling circuses. So that was the beginning of um, her career, which has been very impactful. She's now the director of Born Free, um, the U.S. Uh, primate sanctuary. I'm really excited to listen to what she has to say. So let's let's welcome let's welcome Liz. Uh, 
Liz, I'm trying to get you. Uh... There we go. <laughs> Hi, Lakshmi. Okay, good, good, good. I think I did what I was supposed to. Let's get you in gallery view. There we go. Excellent. Hi. <laughs> well, welcome, and thank you for um, taking your time out and uh, talking to us today about, you know, what Born Free is doing, and specifically your work on animal captivity. I know that uh, it really, reading some of your work, uh, changed my perspective on what I perceived were harmless uh places for animals to be like zoos. And um, I have to say, I did go to the SeaWorld show and thought they were cute. And it just seemed like, oh, the animals are so happy and really not even understanding what the impact is. So that's why I think it's great that you're here to kind of talk to us and, and let us know, um, especially given, you know, not that the Tiger King was, but I think it's exemplary of what our perception is as we see uh, shows like that or um, see animals in other scenarios where, you know, if our, they were doing those things to our dog or our cat, we'd be upset and we think because it's a wild animal, it's better off here than it is there. So why don't you first tell us a little bit about Born Free? I, I know this is gonna date me, but I actually know I remember the theme of the song from the movie, uh, which is, you know, but, and I've been singing it all week as we've been getting ready to have our um, meeting today. But I, I love the story of its inception and the work that you guys are doing. Do you want to tell us Thank a little you. bit about Thank that? You. Thank you so much for having me, in particular on the first um, of these webinars. I don't think I realised it was the first one, so that's really exciting. Um, a disclaimer before we begin on actually on animal captivity. Um, working from home and working with animals, um, my puppy is currently sleeping. She can be a little bit rambunctious, so we may have to do an eviction uh, at some stage. So apologies in advance to anybody who's watching um, if the barking starts. We will resolve that if we have to. Um, Okay, about Born Free, yes. So Born Free was founded in the 1980s by the actors uh, Bill Travers, Virginia McKenna, and their son, Will Travers, who remains, and um, Virginia remains um, very much involved with the organization. We were very lucky to have her come and visit the sanctuary last September, which was wonderful. It was wow. the first time she'd been here. Her son, Will, remains president um, and oversees both Born Free USA and the original kind of founding organization. Born for UK. So it's um, very much still linked into that initial idea. And Born Free was founded off, off the back of a number of things, but core to our work has always been wild animals in captivity. There was a particular elephant in London Zoo, Poli Poli, who was actually the, the kind of inspiration to found the organization by Bill, Virginia, and Will um, back in the 80s. But really, the seeds were sown during the filming of the film Born Free, um, which yes, the, the song ends up stuck in everybody's head <laughs> all the time. I think it's actually the hold music when you when you call the office in the UK. So I walk around <laughs> with it in my head much of the time. Um, and so the, yeah, the process of kind of understanding more about wild animals, what it means to them living in captivity um, and how they suffer when they're kept in captivity was kind of really the driving force behind Born Free being founded. Since then, the organization globally has developed to encompass work such as my work, so animal sanctuaries. There are within the Born Free family, there are a number of sanctuaries, um, the largest primate sanctuary in the US, which um, I'm very fortunate to run, and also sanctuaries in some African countries which care for big cats, which are obviously the iconic species, which is always associated with our organization. Mm -hmm. um, Born Free USA is the younger, um, but no less powerful and um, effective sibling of Born Free UK. We were founded later and we work very closely with the original founder organization, our board shares members. So we um, we're in kind of constant contact, but our work in the US, we have some different campaigns and some different focuses um, in terms of the specifics of it, but ultimately, mm -hmm we're all working towards the same thing. We don't believe that wild animals should be held captive for entertainment, 
Um, if wild animals are held captive, then it should be as part of a rehabilitation program. Yeah. Um, such a rescue rescue centers such as we run here we don't want we have 450 monkeys here to be honest we wish that we could be put out of business because monkeys do not belong in south texas but the guys <laughs> that we look after have come from the exotic trade they've come from the zoo industry they've come from laboratories and so what we provide here at the sanctuary is the best life we can give them ultimately we wish they had been born in their natural troop in their natural mm -hmm. habitat that's i mean and you said it's the largest uh, primate sanctuary in the United States. I'd seen that um, there had been a rescue from one of those small, like, side of the road zoos of, I think they said, what, 300 or 400 animals. And um, a lot of the primates uh, now have a new home within Born Free. Yes, and absolutely. I love the story. No, I didn't love it. It was sad. Mrs. Is, is it Wilkinson? um Wilkins. the Wilkins, Wilkins yes yeah <laughs> yeah so we had we were contacted by ALDF and the Animal Legal Defense Fund to do fabulous work in bringing um so as you say a roadside zoo it had a USDA license it wasn't this kind of road entity it had been cited multiple times under the Animal Welfare Act but it took a not-for-profit organization to do the work, to do the investment, um, and to take the time and bring the legal clout to take mm -hmm. um, the zoo to court. And thankfully, as a result of their work, and also a local um, a local animal rescue group in Iowa who were working with them, they secured basically the confiscation of some 400 animals. Wow. Um, and then undertook the immense operation of working out where to send those animals. And so not only did they deal with the legal side of things, they then um, started dealing with the, the legal rehoming. We were contacted, um, and this makes me very proud, we were contacted because they wanted the primates there to come to us because we're, we're known as an exemplary sanctuary and very proud that we have mm -hmm. GFAS accreditation, which um, is, a, is a rigorous process. And it means that we are one of the most sort of outstanding sanctuaries in the world. So they contacted us, they asked us if we could take uh, five monkeys, so two macaques, Mrs. Milken, our elderly um, new arrival, who we were we were concerned about her. She has many, many health problems. She has arthritis. She has various um, issues with bone deformities, which will go right back to her childhood when she was taken away wow. from her mother. She's young. She won't have been weaned properly. She won't have developed properly. And then a lifetime of poor nutrition will has meant that she is um, physically, she looks very unwell. Uh, mentally, she is one of the feistiest little monkeys I have ever <laughs> met. She takes no prisoners. Um, so we, we agreed to take those two initially. Uh, so there was Mrs. Wilkin and her best friend, Anna. So they came to join us beginning of January. We had a space to put them. Um, they were wonderful. Mrs. Wilkin very quickly showed us who was boss. If you go to her enclosure without a treat, my goodness, <laughs> you're in trouble. Um, she wants nothing to do with you if that's the case. She's she's wonderful, and it's been wonderful to see this elderly monkey who's had such an awful life. Um, yeah. No vet care and no proper nutrition. Nothing really provided for her that she needed. Suddenly thriving in her new environment. Uh, we were also asked to take three baboons, but baboons are <laughs> baboons are kind of a different story. They are much bigger. They are much stronger. Um, they are, I mean, all of the animals we care for, monkeys are dangerous wild animals, but baboons in particular can be extremely dangerous. So that's a real undertaking to take on um, those kind of animals. And we didn't actually have any space to take them. So unfortunately, we had to turn the baboons down. But ALDF was so keen for us to have them that they very generously granted the funding for us to create oh, a one. new space for these baboons. So. Yeah, it was fabulous. So we, we started building straight away and beginning of March, Marlin, Violet and Presley, who we've since found out are probably father and daughters, came <laughs> to join us. And they went from living in a tiny, filthy cage um, without any of their needs being met. They now live in a beautiful one acre open top enclosure. Oh. Um, Ubers who they make friends with. And it's been, it's such a privilege to watch them arrive and thrive in their new homes. It's just wonderful seeing them have this sort of second chance when they've had such an awful start to their lives. That's, that's amazing. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, animal captivity 
and um, in various scenarios and what the impact is in a second. But it was interesting to me that it was um, the Animal Legal Fund that kind of partnered with you um, to try to come up with this like holistic solution. Like, yes, we can take the legal action now. What do we do with the animals next? And um, I thought that that was really interesting because you um, created your own degree program. Uh, you've got a PhD in animal law. And so did you from the beginning think that um, the interception between your activism um, for animal rights, specifically animal captivity, and um, having a legal side can help um, shape policy? Is that what the idea was? Yeah, it really was. I mean, in some ways, my PhD was an exercise in me being incredibly stubborn um, because mm -hmm. as as an animal activist, there are there are narratives, you know, we're talking about today about narratives surrounding immigration. There are also narratives surrounding animal activism and some of it very positive, depending on your outlook, others depending uh, if you take a different view and you're trying to challenge what we're doing, then we can be radicals on, on kind of the kinder side. We can be terrorists on the other side. We can be all of those negative stereotypes which are thrown at the animal rights movement um, and are usually patently untrue. The other thing that we would get is that, you know, you're a bleeding heart liberal. You don't know what you're talking about. Mm. You're not a scientist. So working in a campaigning background for a number of years and trying to change laws, we would find ourselves at the table as an NGO but then we wouldn't necessarily be taken as seriously as we would like. And particularly my PhD program came about because one of my, one of my main interests in terms of academia is looking at having a legal background initially, looking at animal welfare laws. And I feel that they're often held up by governments as a shield to say, we've got this great law, look how well animals are protected. I right. think animal welfare law is also one of the most underfunded areas of law when it comes to enforcement. Anything to do that isn't to do with people, and there's huge underfunding of, of enforcement of law, which deals with people's welfare. But when we're talking about animals, it's even less so. So what interested me was that we had laws technically to protect wild animals and circuses in the UK. We had laws to protect wild animals and zoos in the UK. Mm -hmm. What I was seeing as an activist, and this is kind of where the intersection came in, is I'm looking at the law and I'm going, okay, well, I don't agree with them being in captivity, but if these laws are followed, technically their welfare needs are supposed to be met. What we were seeing in practice was that that wasn't happening. And yet mm. these places still had licenses, which then comes back to the, the roadside zoo where these monkeys came from. They had a license. So they could hold that up and say, you know, we've been granted this license, therefore everything we're doing is fine. And why would members of the public question that? That people mm -hmm. believe that. You know, you've been granted a license, you follow the process. So my PhD came about because I wanted to create, or not create, but show evidence of what we were seeing from a really strong kind of academic footing that couldn't just be dismissed as saying, well, you're emotional about animals about in zoos, and um, therefore this is just your opinion. What I wanted to show was actually, no, we've got evidence. <laughs> and what the research showed was that while the, the law existed, we found um, over a decade, there were 1,000, I wanna say something like 1,100 instances of clear breaches of the law that had been recognized during inspection. And there was one instance over a decade of the correct enforcement action wow. being taken. So that was, so my, yeah, I've got, a, really strong interest in enforcement and that yeah like you say that's where aldf comes in and just that you know making the mm -hmm. forcing the law to be enforced because it doesn't necessarily happen unless there are external factors pushing it so um yeah that's how that's kind of how my phd ended up coming about and that's a big interest of mine well that's amazing because it's true you know without enforcement there's no teeth right and yeah. there's no incentive for anyone to adhere to it uh, adhere to whatever the existing laws are because there's no fear of um, any enforcement. And early on, I, I, um, you, you, you spoke before the uh, Scottish Parliament, and I think your PhD thesis was reviewed by the uh, UK Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I know shortly after your, um, I guess we call it here, testimony or presentation to the Scottish Parliament, they, they banned wild animals and traveling circuses. And I saw that uh, in 2019, even the UK banned wild animals and traveling circuses. So 
you know, how was that when you were talking to uh, members of parliament in terms of, could you see, you know, what part of your presentation kind of lit the light bulb up in their mind thinking that this needed to change? I think with this, and I certainly can't, I was one of many um, people who were working on this issue, one of many organizations, which I actually think was the real strength of that campaign. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the spokespeople, probably from about six organizations who worked on this consistently for, I mean, some of them for decades. Vaughan Free has wow. been involved in this since the, the first beginning of talking about banning wild animals in circuses. Um, another organization I work for, Freedom for Animals in Scotland, one kind. I think one of the strengths of that campaign was that all of the animal welfare organizations, and I mean all of them, we were able to go to parliament and say, we cannot find a single animal welfare organization in this country. And the British Veterinary Association the call to ban wild animals in circuses. And that's almost unheard of because the British Veterinary Association is a professional uh, trade body, if you like. So they don't take positions on things because they, they provide the veterinary care, but they're not a political or campaigning organization. They felt so strongly about this issue that the welfare of wild animals simply can't be met in traveling circuses. Um, that they joined the call. And I think that added a huge amount of weight. So it was it was a really wonderful example of everybody singing from the same song sheet, everybody supporting one another, rallying um, members of the public, and the members of the public were behind it as well. It was, um, I think, something like 95% of the public was the ban. It was a really popular initiative because it was it was kind of a no-brainer, you know, when you see the, the photographs of the tigers in these tiny cages being loaded and offloaded um, onto trucks, when you see, you know, elephants standing shackled by their legs. Um, the welfare arguments were just so obvious, I think, that, mm. yeah, it, it was something that had to happen. There was a huge delay on it because I think there's always this... <laughs> There's a narrative which is which is associated with any kind of changes in animal welfare law, which is this will be the thin end of the wedge. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, if it were, oh, if it was that easy to get one law passed and right. then that just opened the floodgates. But that is what that's what we heard a lot of. Um, and there were also arguments against the campaign that it was specifically targeting a particular community. Um, mm -hmm. So the traveling circus community, which has a lot of, you know, traditional and cultural background. Um, and that it was targeting a particular trade, which would then open up other trades for the same kind of um, the same kind of treatment. I mean, the, of course, it wasn't targeting a community as such because there is no issue with traveling circuses per se. It's traveling circuses with animals in them. It was the animals we're concerned about, and it certainly wasn't an exercise in persecution. But there were all of those factors that played into it. So it took a very long time to go through. But yeah. I, I can't take credit for it. I'm very proud to have been part of it, but well, yeah. it's, you know, it's uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So, um, you, was there any reason why did you think targeting circuses as a whole just would not be accepted? So, um, because you saw the um, that the issues with the traveling circus in terms of animal care were so much the offenses were so much greater uh, because they traveled that uh, the campaign basically wanted to target the traveling circuses first. It was really, it, that was really interesting from a legal perspective because how this started out, first of all, there were no static circuses in the United Kingdom at that time. Oh. So there weren't circuses that had their own base that people would come and visit. They were traveling by virtue of the fact, frankly, because it was a dying tradition they would not have been able to attract the number of people for regular shows if they stayed in one place. So right. that was kind of more of a market demand thing. We didn't have static circuses. So there was that element to it. But also the reason that traveling was such a key factor was that the initial plans were to introduce the ban under the Animal Welfare Act. Okay. And under the Animal Welfare Act, it had to show very specific elements, scientifically proven elements that this is something that's affecting the animal's welfare and traveling, unloading, all of that stuff, moving around constantly, living in temporary accommodation was something that we could speak very clearly to. There was a, the government were concerned about gray areas if we were talking about static surfaces, if they exist, how would they differ from zoos? Mm -hmm. 
um, and they didn't want to go there. So traveling circuses became a focus because we could speak so much to the welfare issues of traveling with wild animals. What actually happened in the end was the government decided that they didn't want to introduce it under the Animal Welfare Act. We think that was a mistake, but that mm. was what they chose. And they eventually introduced it under ethical grounds, which is kind of interesting because we now have a ban in the UK on wild animals in traveling circuses on ethical grounds, but technically not a ban on them in static circuses. So if we're talking ethics, then the traveling um, becomes kind of irrelevant. But that's how that's how that sort of came about. Right. And I, you know, when I was when I was reading the legislation, I kept thinking, what's, you know, because I remember Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey growing up and they would come into town at a specific period. And I said, what circuses are thought the same thing that what circuses are static? But then I wondered, you know, because of this ban, did you start seeing that there were more circuses that claimed to be static? There was, there was one, um, one guy who'd been involved in traveling circuses for many years who owned his own big cats and kind of rented the big cat back mm -hmm. out to traveling circuses. He did a very short stint in Scotland where he, he claimed to be a static circus and then claimed to be something else. And I think, to be honest, <laughs> To his credit, to some extent, he was working out where what he could get away with. Um, mm -hmm. In the end, it was it was called a, a night with lions and tigers. It was set at this, this kind of static show that people could visit. It wasn't very popular. There was a lot of opposition to it because you know people, the public weren't that interested in the details of the legislation. Um, what they were voting for and what they were um, responding to surveys about was they didn't want to see tigers in cages being made to jump through hoops and they didn't mm -hmm. care if they were in a in a tent in one place in Scotland or if they were being moved around in tents you know to different tents in Scotland and um, so it wasn't very popular and to my knowledge it just kind of died a bit of a death. Wow wow yeah I mean I um you know from the you know reading about you know the treatment of animals in circuses whether you know and then you know, I could kind of understand that because I thought, you know, it doesn't look very professional. They, you know, animals never look happy. But when I listened to your speech um, about SeaWorld and I actually watched the documentary Blackfish, having been a um, person that visited SeaWorld with her kids, I've even got the, still got the stuffed animals for them. You know, as I was watching that, when you know back in the day when i went to sea world i thought all the animals look so happy you know everyone looks so happy this is just so wonderful not thinking at all about the origins and the conditions and the, this is not their habitat they're not going to be happy and you know blackfish uh the documentary was kind of a hard documentary to watch to be honest with you because i just didn't realize um and when you see at the beginning of the film how they're sourcing the orcas and they're actually going after the babies because they're easier, they're cheaper to transport. And you see this like, I don't know, 70 year old tattooed up fisherman saying that he cried when he witnessed that. And then you could actually see that as they're taking the baby orcas, uh, the mothers and babies are just they're crying, you know, um, yeah. it was, it was really, and then you take it around to why, you know, I think it was at least two trainers. I know there was one that was featured in, the, I think but there was a, there was another trainer actually before her that was killed. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you know, that whole process of being taken away from your environment and the mental health ramifications and because orcas don't eat people normally i mean they don't so the I, I think in one of the trainers they the orca bit the the trainer but that's not their natural um response so no absolutely i think the com with sea world it's a combination so you had the the orcas being taken from the wild and this would have this happened in zoos across the world so wild animals being taken from the wild from their natural habitat exactly the same process that we saw in blackfish i know exactly the scene you're talking about we went a uh, colleagues of mine i was working for a, an animal 
captivity organization and we went to the cinema to watch Blackfish. We were so excited this, this kind of campaigning film was out. And I remember watching that scene and just, if I hadn't been sat in the middle of people, I would have had to leave because that scene was so difficult to watch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, zoos would take animals from the wild for, for decades, since their inception, um, 200 odd years ago. And it was only really with the introduction of things like CITES law, which then um, started to regulate the trade in endangered animals, that that didn't, that became less possible. So we're talking only really going back to the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. that animals for zoos generally weren't taken from the wild. Um, and so we have, so if you have animals who have very long lives, so we're talking about elephants, Elderly elephants in zoos right now will have been taken from their natural habitat, will have been taken from their family. So if anybody's been to a zoo and they've seen an elderly elephant there, that elephant will have been taken from their home and brought to the zoo to be put in that enclosure to be put on display. Um, there's arguments that certain animals deal in different ways with captivity um, and that some cope better than others. But I think when, when we're talking about wild animals, there's a couple of things. They are hardwired. Um, they're hardwired, they've adapted to live in their natural environment. An orca who was born in a swimming pool in Florida still has the instincts to migrate, still has the instincts to live in these huge social groups that are, you know, hugely complex and they develop lifelong relationships with other animals, elephants the same. Mm -hmm. um, the opposite for kind of non-social animals, big cats who are forced to live in small enclosures in zoos when they would naturally be solitary. Um, mm -hmm. Animals forced to mate, put, put in completely unnatural situations. Uh, we see pandas being, you know, um, anesthetized and inseminated on a regular basis because we're desperate to breed pandas because um, they're in danger in the wild. And what ends up happening is exactly what I think you mentioned at the outset that people can maybe empathize with a little bit more right now is that you spend too long in the same place and you are denied your freedom of movement. There's a reason that we incarcerate people as one of the worst punishments we can give to another human yes. being is taking away their liberty. Why we think that wouldn't have a similar effect on animals is beyond me. Um, particularly when animals will generally they will traverse much, much bigger spaces than we would. Um, mm -hmm. So what we see is depression, literal depression. You know, in the in SeaWorld, there were a number of animals who were on antidepressants. There is an entire kind of pharmaceutical sector which deals with antidepressants for wow. animals. Um, and wild animals develop depression when they're in, when they're kept in captive situations and they're denied natural social um, opportunities when they're denied their natural climate, when they're denied their natural habitat, when they're denied the challenges that they would normally have mm -hmm. in their day-to-day -day life. And so we see them turning aggression on each other. We see them really disturbingly turning aggression on themselves. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen this with, with monkey self-harming, biting their own hands, biting their own tails. Wow. We have a baboon, Betsy, who was kept for 33 years as a pet. She's mis missing part of one of her hands because she literally chewed it off. Oh um, the the, the long-term effects of isolation from your own kind and from your species is immense. Um, and wild animals are not domesticated. Domesticated animals, rightly or wrongly, the, the puppy sleeping on my bed is not a wolf, um, you know, and whether or not we should have submitted animals to the process of domestication is a question that's kind of moot now because it happened tens mm -hmm. of thousands of years ago. It changed animals genetically. Dogs are not wolves. Domestic cats are not tigers. Right. Um, tigers are tigers <laughs> and wolves are wolves. And they still have those same instincts. They can't live along pe alongside people happily. They can't live in concrete uh, enclosures happily. They can't live in confined, confined spaces happily. And so we see it manifesting in serious mental health issues. And, you know, I think, especially now where, because we, you know, I was watching one documentary, it was supposed to be about uh, neuroprocesses and, you know, they, the researcher was tickling a rat mm -hmm. and the rat was laughing. And, you know, he, they were saying, you know, cause you don't associate the emotions that we have, we can empathize with my dog. Like if I have to put my dog, I take her to work every day so she doesn't have to be alone. Um, you know, so I can, 
look at her and I can see that she feels sad or, but in our mind, we sit there and say, we don't afford that to a baboon or to an elephant um, and understand that as we're experiencing all these issues with self secluding um, and people saying it's unnatural, we're social beings, we like to be around people. We don't translate that into animals. And so we're able to watch. Um, and I want to talk about the um, wild breeding and, you know, when I read that there are more big cats in captivity than they are out in the wild, that blew my mind. And then as I started reading more and more about it, it's that whole idea of like with the orcas, that a lot of times they go after the cubs. And, you know, the cubs, they will miss, you know, for photo ops and other things. And um, it's horrible. I mean, so Tiger King and, you know, all of the breeding and the types of things that they're doing. Um, what are your thoughts on, I know what your thoughts are, but can you <laughs> tell us why <laughs> some um, of those? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Tiger King was really interesting. I think just as a, as you can probably imagine, my colleagues and I, my friends and I have discussed this a lot. I think um, the actual documentary itself was a fairly irresponsible example of filmmaking that, that made it this soap opera about individual people. Um, what I found really shocking about that was the normalization of the abuse. So um, I won't talk too much about what actually happened in the documentary because people might not have seen it, but there are scenes where the owner is the protagonist is literally beating the animals. He is taking away babies from mothers a few hours old and narrating this and I think that almost got that got lost in the whole kind of you know mm -hmm. scandal around the people but people didn't recognize that as abuse because I watched that and I came away from that feeling sick mm -hmm. but that isn't what's being talked about so I think the idea of tigers in captivity is so normalized that people didn't see that kind of it became a this kind of inconsequential backdrop to this documentary where these right. animals were being abused used on camera there was there was points where he was kicking he was grabbed by the ankle and he's kicking one of them and i think he either points or fires a gun near their head it's animal abuse and it was being broadcast but it wasn't the that wasn't people's takeaway from it and i've read in recent days that it reopened recently and they had just hordes of people going to see so that the actual animal welfare message of that documentary was completely lost which is heartbreaking because it could have been such a great opportunity yeah well so you know, i think things I'm sorry, I was going to say that I, I had heard, you know, from people I know, because, and not, be, you know, it's because they didn't, they weren't thinking through as to the ramifications, but they'd say, oh, I'd love to have a big cat as a pet. Um, those cubs look so cute. And I, as a mom, I'm sitting there thinking, but you can't take a baby, any baby away from its mother that early and have it handled by so many people and there not be health ramifications to that. I mean, I found that to be yeah, absolutely really disturbing. I think there's a number of things. The other thing that we're really used to seeing with tigers in captivity is there are a lot of white tigers featured. Um, and white tigers exist in, um, there was a small pocket of um, white lions in Kruger National Park. There's been small pockets of um, white tigers, but they're not a species. And um, they are a genetic anomaly. Oh. So basically, to, to, if you if you wanted to breed a white tiger, you would have to breed a white mum and a white dad. That would mean inbreeding two animals who have a known genetic anomaly. So what you end up with, white tigers, white lions, these kind of white, mm -hmm. basically any kind of white colour morph, um, they are by default inbred. And what that leads to is there's been, it's been known for decades that this creates all sorts of um, health issues. There's cranial abnormalities. If you were to Google um, white tigers, you will see there are a number of um, issues like poor dentition, um, neurological issues, um, shortened lifespan, 
all sorts of um, medical issues with them because it is literally inbreeding animals deliberately to create an animal who looks a particular way because people literally because people like to look at them. That's so the breeding of white tigers, even among much of the zoo community, is frowned upon because whilst we don't necessarily believe that um, there is any conservation value to breeding animals in captivity, there is absolutely no question that breeding white tigers does any good whatsoever. Um, so there's that. There is, as you say, taking animals away from their mother at a couple of days old is horrible for their emotional development and also their physical development. Um, big cats have been known, uh, one of the um, animals who really suffer if they are not given the childhood that they're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And they develop very, very serious um, mental um, and physiological health issues as a result of that. What is the... Um what's the regulatory you know it, is there a lot with for breeding wild animals i mean is there a lot of because it would seem to me that if that's a genetic anomaly and it's not good for the animal to bre inbreed like that and it's known scientifically isn't there any regulation that would isn't there any oversight uh for wild animal breeding no, unfortunately not, or not that I know of anyway, um, because, and I think this comes back to a really fundamental point with animals is that animals are under global law deemed as property, and therefore you can do as you wish with your property. So you, you cannot, there isn't really a way of controlling that. There's a way of controlling conditions of breeding. So for example, you know, if you have a dog breeding company or things like that, then the and the welfare standards of your facility can be overseen but in terms of controlling breeding it's literally it's kind of frowned upon but there's nothing that can be done to stop it wow. the zoo industry has um, breeding programs where they hold stud books and they um, connect different zoos with one another to take part in breeding programs theoretically to avoid inbreeding and to manage that process, but it's not legally managed. And to be honest, research has shown that a lot of the animals who are on those books are kind of the pet project of whichever particular researcher holds a stud book. And then there's also questions, there's wider questions about breeding animals in captivity who are never going to be released to the wild. Is that ethically sound? We would argue mm -hmm. that it isn't. Um, and also the idea, the kind of wider narrative that if the zoo industry ranging from the worst roadside zoo to the absolute, you know, quote unquote, best zoo in the world. If they are breeding animals and telling people that that's conservation, whereas mm -hmm. the animals are going extinct in the wild, then I think that raises serious questions about to what end are you breeding these animals? They become these kind of genetic vehicles for their species, but what about the individual? If we only have Bengal tigers who live in concrete enclosures in zoos, have right. we really done anything to save that species? I think it direct it diverts very important attention away from really critical conservation conversations that need to be happening where these animals live in their natural habitat. Um, and it, it makes you wonder because you said you talked earlier about the panda, and you know we're all think I'm thinking as I'm watching. You know they had a webcam in there. Everybody's watching it oh, there's not enough pandas in the wild, so this is a great service that they're doing. But, you know, and it sounds, it's probably, you're probably thinking, why didn't she think of this earlier? But really, you know, you, as you're, you don't think of it from that perspective, because that's what it is, right? I mean, everything is about trying to understand that different perspective. And um, now thinking about it, it is, you know, we are just breeding them to then continue to cage them and not, we're not bringing them out into their natural habitat. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, I, for those who may not know, um, I know we've we touched a little bit about zoos, but what's the difference between like uh, zoos and other captivity and sanctuaries? Because okay. some people may think, Although when I listened to one of the video uh, about Miss, I think Wilkins, um, the veterinarian was saying that, you know, we're going to be the, the, the type of care. And she even mentioned um, acupuncture. So I, I'm pretty sure that they don't have acupuncture therapy at zoos. But can you tell us what, um, 
the differences? Sure, I think, and I think that that's a question we get asked a lot. Um, and I think that it's something that isn't necessarily obvious. There are, there are good sanctuaries and there are less great sanctuaries. <laughs> There are zoos on sliding scales, you know, so from the worst roadside zoos, like I mentioned before, you know, the most well-funded um, zoo in the world. And ultimately, you would be able to find comparable institutions in both camps. So you would be able to find a sanctuary which looks very much like a zoo, where perhaps the enclosures are very similar, the level of care is very similar. I think the difference is that for sanctuaries, our aim is not to create more captive animals. Right. zoos kind of um, reason for being is the reason they exist is their businesses who display animals to the public whether cynically just to make money whether because there's a genuine belief that it's contributing to conservation i think it's probably somewhere in the middle but what they're ultimately doing is they're breeding more and more wild animals into a captive situation mm -hmm. what we do at a sanctuary is that we provide the best possible home that we can for animals who have nowhere else to go we do not breed them. We provide a home for life, which is something zoos have been known um, across the board to, to quote unquote cull animals, so kill them when they're either not genetically useful for breeding programs, if they are they are overstocked. These are all phrases that I hate, but we, when we take in an animal, we take on that animal for life. We provide the best possible care that we can. Um, we don't open to visitors. Some sanctuaries do in a controlled way, and it really depends on the animals you're dealing with and how well they cope. I think the fundamental difference with sanctuaries is that we are there to do the absolute best we can for the animals. Zoos are there first and foremost as businesses to exhibit animals. And so there's um, no, that's you probably don't, quite controversial. And there's obviously crossover in some and, sense. And people can't, it's not open to the public to interact with the animals. This is to provide as close to a uh, natural habitat for the animals as you possibly can. Is that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it means the kind of the optics, if you like, are very different. Our enclosures are designed to provide the best possible space for the animals. It doesn't matter if you can't see them from all angles. So we have a 150, we're at 156, we have a 56 acre enclosure, which is home to 200 free roaming macaques. We drive in there um, two or three times a day. We feed out there, we change waters, we check on everyone to the best of our ability. But ultimately, if they don't want us to see them, they can go off into the trees and we don't see everyone every day. If we need to find somebody who's sick, we can spend hours in there, you know, looking for an individual. Mm -hmm. But they have more freedom than perhaps an animal in a zoo would because an animal in a zoo, the complaints, when you come to see the elephants, if the elephants are roaming across 56 acres and you don't get to see them that day, then that leads to complaints. So zoos right. are created around the visitor's gaze. Sanctuaries are created around the animal's needs. So, mm. it, so practically, like I say, you could look at a zoo and you could look at a sanctuary and they could look very similar. Um, and you could argue that, you know what, it doesn't really, the, to the animals, they don't care. You know, the animals don't care if they're in a zoo or they're in a sanctuary. Um, but our ethics are very different, our mission is very different, and our end game is very different. We basically want to put ourselves out of business. I would love if there were no more captive monkeys to come and live yeah. in poses we have here, because monkeys don't belong in cages, full stop. And they can't be, these animals can't be released to the wild now because they are not used to being... No, and anymore. that really speaks to, again, your point about the about the tiger cubs and lion cubs being taken away from their mothers these animals have not been uh, you imagine a, a human child being brought up in absolute isolation of any other human beings and imagine what that might look like if they then try and integrate they then like you know as an adult integrating into the world without the language without the social skills without the you know without everything they need that they would have learned from either a family or community, um, these animals simply wouldn't survive in the wild. Um, and the other thing is they are, they're also a threat to their living counterparts because they've been bred in unnatural situations. Um, you know, when we talk about zoo breeding, the idea of breeding for conservation, there's been studies done, I know certainly in the UK, there were studies done on lions, which found that genetically, most of the lions there were hybrids. So saving a species, quote unquote, if they were to be, that would then have a significant impact if they were to then interbreed with 
free living animals, that would then have an impact literally at, at species level. So from a point of view from their own welfare, they wouldn't survive in the wild, mm. they wouldn't have the skills. Um, and from a genetic level, then introducing animals who have never been in that environment, the same way, you know, the same way that colonizers came and brought diseases and things that, you know, taking the flu um, across the sea and absolutely devastating indigenous communities. It's a similar kind of thing that, you know, you take an animal who was born in a lab in the US and try and release them amongst a, a colony of, of Japanese macaques in Japan, that could be incredibly dangerous for both, for both the animal being released and the animals will be there. Right, right. No, and um, I wanted to touch on one thing before we go into, want to make sure we talk about your O1 before we, uh, we finish our seminar, but you know, when you talk about breeding, I went to visit a dairy farm and mm -hmm. we were just there to, you know, um, what are the issues within the industry and that we, breeding wasn't even part of uh, the focus of our, our visit with the business group, but they started telling us how they artificially inseminate all the cows and they genetically mm -hmm. select it so that those cows only have another female cows. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have been doing this for quite some time. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, first of all, aside from how horrible that is that they're doing this, you know, to these, to these cows, but also what is the product of the milk going to be like? You know, this is a dairy farm that's producing milk. And I just feel like when you're screwing with nature that way in very unnatural ways, then the byproduct can't be something anyone would want. But um, so talking about unnatural ways, the whole, I unfortunately um, YouTubed for about two seconds, the Wuhan market, just to see what, um, the concern that a lot of diseases because of the way the market. So I wanted to understand that without a, assessing any blame. And I thought, well, let me just look at what the market looked like. And I turned it on and it was the first part of the market was, and I've got, I've got a dog. So I think it hit home in particular was the food market with all the dogs there. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there, you know, you know, any international, UN organization, whether it's from a health perspective, because we've seen at least a couple of diseases come out of there. And I don't know if they've really, I know that they're, they're assuming that it's because of, you know, the, um, what is it, the wet markets, but um, I don't know if they've done a cause and effect. I, I don't know if they've been able to say, but I'm just curious from when I looked at that and I thought, I don't even know what else is out there and what all they're doing. I mean, as soon as I saw the dogs and I thought they were there to sell until, you know, there was a butcher table right next to it. And I just had to shut the video off immediately. But is there any, um, you know, United Nations or any, you know, international group that is not that I'm, you know, everybody has their own thing. I'm not judging, but I'm just saying um, from that perspective, looking at those wet markets. Yeah, I think there's certainly been moves um, since, particularly since the, the start of this pandemic, to look at wet markets. I mean, none of this is particularly new. So we know that pandemics have started from animals and it's not just, um, I think we're associating this particular pandemic with, with kind of exotic animals. There's talk of it might have come from snakes or bats or via pangolins or, you know, all of these animals who are kind of very alien to us. Um, and we may never have seen them in, in our lives. But for example, um, SARS came from farms, as I understand it, here in the US. So I think the issue, we as an organization have been talking a lot about this and how, kind of what the approach is. I think there's, we would really like to see a much more holistic view where we start thinking about our relationship with wildlife because the, the wet market is almost like the end product of yeah. a much bigger network. Um, sure. which is 
wildlife trade, which is animal welfare, which is conservation, which is, you know, how did these animals get there in the first place? So we're talking illegal wildlife trade, legal wildlife trade, importing and exporting. Um, the entire way that we view our relationship with animals and animal use. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. something that really jars people here um, and kind of in the Western world is when we see animals who we would treat as sacred. So I've mentioned her multiple times, my puppy sleeping on my bed. The idea, I mean, I'm, I'm vegan. I haven't eaten animals since I was 10 or 11 years old. Mm. But the idea of eating a dog makes me feel physically sick. Um, but I think as well, one of the things that's interesting, and this also then speaks to how we relate to wild animals generally, you said before you're empathizing with your dog because you live with your dog and they're so familiar. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things the research has shown, we find it much more difficult to empathize both with individuals, whether they are animal or human. And this, this <laughs> gets like really wide, but I won't go into all of that. But people, uh, individuals who look like us, individuals we're familiar with, species we're familiar with, we will naturally have more empathy towards. An elephant, with, they're just so unusual. They're, they're so weird looking. And unless you're from a range state where you see elephants, then empathizing with them and trying to find similarities is very different, difficult. So I think for us, we would love to see action taken on wildlife trade generally because wherever there is unnatural... Um, mm -hmm. association between species that should never meet in such right. close contact, whether that's in a wet market, whether it's in a zoo, whether it's in mm -hmm. a circus, whether it's from hunting, yes. um, all of these different things present those risks. So I think from an organizational point of view, we're really interested in like widening that conversation up and saying, okay, what is our relationship with wildlife? What is our relationship with animals? What needs to change to be able to help this never happen again? And I think it also goes into human rights stuff, you know, working conditions in those markets, um, working conditions in meat packing factories. So we're seeing like meat packing factories being closed down. And most of the time, people working in those industries are people of color. They are people who are in a vulnerable financial situation, who don't necessarily have access to healthcare. There's a whole thing about it, which where you've got intensive food production, you've also often got issues surrounding human rights and human welfare as well. So I, I would love to, for it to be looked at in this really kind of wide lens view. That was a very right. rambling response to your well, question. You know, you know, e even with immigration, I'm always, um, I'll talk to groups that are, I know are anti, or not, well, I won't say they're anti-immigration, they're not really pro-immigration. And um, I'll tell them, my first thing I'll say to them is you may not like immigration, you may not even like immigrants, but if you want uh, your GDP to grow, um, if you want salaries to be increased, here's the things you're gonna have to do on the immigration front. So I was thinking on the same, you know, people who believe in animal rights, well, you don't really have to sell that to them, but there's a vast majority of people that may not empathize by seeing a video or a documentary, but they know that this pandemic was catastrophic and so trying to make sure we're doing everything we can to you know keep another pandemic from taking place and then I thought that that may be you know kind of another way of trying to get to the animal rights objective um, from a different side. Absolutely and I think that's and I've seen a lot of conversations going on from the very simplistic which I don't think is particularly helpful right now is the very simplistic conversation where it's like go vegan and this will never happen again. Right. Um, it's much it's much wider than that. Um, to the kind of there's been surveys been being done where you know sort of story um, poll type things where mm -hmm. you know now that you've seen that there's a link between um, consuming animal animal products and and this pandemic would it stop you eating animal products? A lot of people are like nope. And I think, you know, food choices and things are so tied up in, the, you know, tradition and culture yeah. and family and community. And there, are some, there are some amazing groups doing amazing work on stuff like that. Um, like the Food Empowerment Project looks at the intersections of animal food production and human rights and how it all combines. I'd recommend people checking that out definitely when we're looking at consumption of animals and um, what that might lead to in terms of health, um, health consequences then 
uh, it's, re it's a really interesting conversation, definitely. Can you, in, were you referencing a study or a documentary um, about, you know, looking at food reduction and, uh, and human rights as a whole? Can you, if, you, if you've got some resources, we had someone who um, asked a question if we could send them some resources afterwards. Um, yeah, I mean, information the on some food, of this. food empowerment project is a is an organization which works very and um, specifically it's run by uh, women of color it's a it's a awesome organization they do wonderful work surrounding that um, and that is their full focus there's also um there's other organizations yeah so there's some who are kind of doing active work on the ground um and there's others who are kind of really looking at kind of outreach and education surrounding it so food empowerment project will be my go-to on that specific food issue of those project. intersections and then i'll have a think there's probably others that i um that yeah i can recommend afterwards definitely that's fantastic you know it is um i was telling everyone i said you know i'm sure you'll enjoy hearing her talk I became a fan. I mean, I just was obsessively <laughs> listening to your, cause you know, I just feel like, I feel like you present it in a very different way. Um, you know, I, I think in one of your talks, you said, you know, you said exactly that, you know, about food, it's a personal choice. Um, about medical testing, you could, you could kind of, you know, you don't agree with it, but you could see how people could justify it because it's something very personal. But going to a zoo just for our pleasure didn't seem to justify the harm that it, it causes the animal. And I thought that that was um, a great way in which you're not really, because any people think that anyone who supports animals, they're all, you know, vegans and, you know, they, they don't want, you know, the idea that they don't want anyone eating animals and you know that whole lot but you were you you made that really nice analysis that there is no especially in this day and age of technology there's no benefit really even education wise to a zoo because you can do it virtual um so you know it, yeah. it didn't seem to it just seems it seems so frivolous yeah it's, it seems such a frivolous thing um I think what's interesting is, you know, sort of food product, eating, you know, consuming animals' flesh and the, the kind of um, testing on animals is this kind of very prolonged thing which goes on over a period of time. You know, you are somebody who consumes animal flesh, you're kind of invested in it. That's that was a very negative way of putting it. But, you know, if you're a meat right. eater, you eat meat and you eat fish, then it's part of your life, it's part of your day to day, it's something you do daily every few days. But going to the zoo, it's something you might do once every few years if you happen to have a spare Saturday afternoon. But it's right. that combination of all those people going to the zoo that one Saturday afternoon. And it does it really make a difference to your life? No. But does it? Would it make a difference if those animals didn't have to be there? Yes. So I think that's oh. that's I feel strongly about that because people have asked, you know, well, zoos are not zoos are probably not. You know, animals suffer more in intensive farming. Um, or animals suffer more in the section. And that may be true, but I just feel that animals suffer so unnecessarily and for such frivolous reasons that people don't, they're not really invested in it in zoos. And so, in right. some ways, to me, that makes it almost cost more benefit important. analysis. If we can't agree not to use them, yeah, if we can't agree not to use them for those purposes that don't even really benefit us, then how are we going to start a conversation about taking animals out of our diet or not? Right trying medical research on animals, you know, how are we even going to start that conversation if we're still using them for such pointless things, you know? Yeah, and I thought that point was just excellent. Um, Thank you. To get to, you know, clearly anyone who's listening today would understand why you qualified for that very um, difficult uh, visa classification, which is O1 for extraordinary ability. But even with your you know, you were a slam dunk in terms of, um, you know, all the things that you accomplished and, you know, uh, the, the impact you've had internationally, because that's the standard. And it's usually from a very few people at the very top of their field. But even for your petition, and this is just to kind of underscore the fact that even for somebody who is, you know, got 
there's no question how extraordinary your qualifications are. There's no question the benefit of having you with your unique skill set at the Born Free U.S. Primate Sanctuary, you know, what that does for the United States to be able to have that here. But we just don't simply tell USCIS, hey, she's got these qualifications, give her the visa. Um, it, you, we had to get expert uh, documents. The petition was about this big. And you were probably um, the demographic that is not, does not get a lot of vetting. Yes. If, um, you know, because there is, there is that bias within adjudications that a lot of people don't know about. And um, even though you were in that favorable demographic, um, it still was not a slam dunk. So how did you feel, you know, when you went for the interview and the process, um, even though you knew you were highly qualified and there would be no issue um, um, with the visa process? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I feel, not just feel, I am incredibly privileged. And, I, and you said it kind of apologetically, but yes, I am white. I'm from England. I have a PhD. I tick the boxes of the, the quote unquote desirable immigrant, if you like. Um, I'm coming from a huge position of privilege. And also I was incredibly lucky that my uh, visa application was sponsored by Born Free. So mm -hmm. I can't imagine, my process was very easy, having heard how, did, and having heard the narratives about right. immigration, I felt very, very lucky. Um, and it made me realize quite how different other people's process is. And yet I had, you know, I ticked the boxes and I'd done the work and I got the doctorate mm -hmm. and things like that. But had I been from a different country, had I had a different skin color, had I been a different nationality, um, had I had different experience, had I had huge potential, but hadn't had the opportunity to do what I'd done educationally, which again speaks to my background and my ability and my privilege in my own country. It's like everything is stacked so that, you know, I, everything was stacked for me to succeed. Um, right. I think I've done, so I, I feel very, very lucky. Uh, I didn't find the process particularly difficult, but I know people who have struggled. I've, I volunteer with an organization which works with refugees who've recently arrived from, um, often from um, Central South America. Mm -hmm. And to the foil, the difference between their experience with immigration and my experience right. with these people have got no less potential than I have. And in fact, you know, these people are often fleeing for their lives, for their own safety. Right. Um, and then not everything is stacked against them um, in a way that has just been, it's been very, very obvious to me. So in the sense, I feel incredibly lucky that I was given the visa. I was able to take up my absolute dream job here. Um, I'm really grateful that you are having the conversation about immigration because right. everyone has potential. Um, mm -hmm. The fact I got to do stuff before I came here to show what that might look like is because I'm very lucky in my life um, you know right. other people who might have potential to do wonderful things in the US are being denied that opportunity before they even get a chance which I just think is such a shame for them and, and also for the US because, yeah no I was gonna say but on the same token now we're seeing denial rates going for O's and um, it's you know I, I've been practicing for over 20 25 years. Um, and I remember a time where for somebody with your background, with all the boxes ticked and the accomplishments you've had, the petition would have been about this big. You know, we would have just had to kind of write out. I think our, our, um, our argument uh, outlining that you're extraordinary was I think 20 to 30 pages, just our argument alone. And I remember yeah. my arguments would be about 10 pages um, mm -hmm. previously. So even for somebody that's, um, like I said, that's got all the boxes ticked, that's with a great organization, that's above and beyond what the uh, regulations outline that a person of extraordinary ability needs to meet, it's still not you know, a slam dunk and you still have to 
you know, kill a small forest in order to submit the petition. And um, for, you know, the more you get away from those boxes being ticked and, um, you know, all those other things, the larger and larger the evidence and the more hurdles they, they have to go through. But I'm, I'm glad that you're aware that a lot of people um, are not aware of the disparities. And I want to thank you so much for, I could talk to you all day. I want to thank you so much for all the, you know, insight and information and the great work you guys are doing um, at the Born Free. You know, I, I just loved watching the videos of the different animals and the stories you guys are telling. And um, thank you again for doing that great work. And Thank you for opening my eyes. Um, after I, you know, you told me about what happens with monkeys at zoos. My daughter lives in Missouri, and everyone kept saying, "You got to go to the Missouri Zoo." Missouri Zoo. I said, "I'm sorry, I don't do zoos. Don't do zoos." So, um, you know, you, you know, it's, it's <laughs> when people like you are able to get the information out, and you know, kind of, kind of make us rethink what, what is actually going on versus what our perception is. Um, it really makes a difference. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for having me on to be able to talk about these things. It's been it's been great fun. And your dog has been absolutely your puppy's been absolutely quiet, behaving very well. Yeah, behaved. It's unheard of. It's absolutely unheard of. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, and I look forward to seeing the rest of you next um, on our next immigration stars and stripes. Thanks again, Liz. Thank you, Lakshmi. Take care. Bye.